Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation on giving open source software a tax break. I think by now you should all be familiar with the format. So this is a pre-recorded session and my my digital version on the bottom left will guide you through the presentation while I'll, I'm available in the chat to answer any questions you might have. Um, before we start, I, two sentences to myself. My name is Sven Frank, I'm German. I work for Nexedi, which is a free software publisher in the north of France, actually not so far from Brussels. And I mostly work on administration and application for European and French R&D projects. And I'm also the treasurer for the Fonds de Dotation du Libre, which applied to hold this presentation today. Uh, it's an endowment fund. I will also use the abbreviation FDL now because my French pronunciation is still lacking. So every time I talk about FDL, it's the Fonds de Dotation de Libre. For today's presentation, it took me about 20 minutes. I will first explain you what is FDL, what is a French endowment fund. I will give you some examples how, how you can use tax breaks to finance open source software. Um, afterwards, I want to introduce a few examples of projects we either have completed or which we are currently working on. And I'll close with some takeaways, which for me are the points which well, you should have, you should take away from this presentation. So let's start. Um, FDL, it's like I said, it's an endowment fund created in 2018. Um, I don't know about the specificities in other countries, but in France, it's relatively easy to set up an endowment fund. You basically have to define the statutes and submit them to the prefecture for validation. And once it's validated that your endowment fund is in the way it's set up is serving a, a general public interest, then you're more or less ready to go. Um, for us, the idea to FDL was since at Next City, we do quite a lot of government sponsored R&D projects. We wanted to replicate this procedure of applying for R&D budgets and projects uh, within FDL. This means we, we require a dossier for every project which is to be undertaken. And we have an expert committee currently with three, three panel members who evaluate proposals and who on the one hand have to assure that it's serving general public interest. And on the other hand, that it's a project they would recommend the FDL to finance. Uh, once this is done and it is financed, projects will, ah, no, the other way. Um, first, I want to talk about the tax exemption. So um, the fond dotation or endowment funds in general, they finance themselves uh, through donations. So in France, there's two levels of donations. One is 60% and one is 66%, one for corporations and one is for individuals. If I have some details on every slide, if you scroll down, um, we'll either provide links like in this case or some more explanations. Um, like I said, there's two versions or two different rates you can use for corporations that can reclaim up to 60% of donations, um, up to 2 million euros or, or, and it's capped at half a percent of the annual turnover. So if you're a company and you're making 1 million of turnover, you can, you have a cap of 5,000 euro, which means you can make a donation of 5,000 euro and can claim back 60% from taxes you will have to pay in the future. So that is 3000 euro for individuals. The percentage is 66% and the maximum is 20% of your taxable income. So also an example, if you have 40,000 euro taxable income, you can donate 8,000 euro per year and recover 66% of it from taxes you have to pay. Uh, so a donation of 2000 euro would mean you could have a tax exemption of 1,320 euro. To give you two examples, how this works. So, Imagine you have a company and you donate 10,000 euro to FDL. You can claim back 6,000 euros at the end of the year on the taxes you will have to pay. Uh, FDL on the other side will receive project proposals to finance the development of certain open source software or 
uh, similar proposals. Let's say it's a software project in this case, and there's some features set to be developed. So we would run this project proposals by our committee who have to evaluate it, like I said earlier. And if they, if they agree and approve, then it's a project FDL will undertake. So eventually they will pay the developer 10,000 euro for, for adding in this case feature one, two, three to, to the software. A variation to this is if you also utilize what is called in France credit d'impôt de recherche. So it's also a, um, a reimbursement on tax you have to pay uh, for R&D activity, not for research activities, not development. So if I do the same example, a company would donate 7,000 euro to FDL. It could claim back 4,200 euro at year's end. Um, at the same time, a project proposal, which now doesn't have development, but research items. So which, which is a research project more than a development project would also qualify for the credit d'impôt de recherche, which means, uh, you could still finance a project worth 10,000 euro. And in this case, FDL, uh, would pay 7,000 euro to the developer and the developer could claim back 3,000 euro for his research activities from the taxes he will have to pay. So same result, you can finance projects of up to 10,000 euro doing it like this. Um, I next want to talk about actual projects, which where we apply both of the, uh, both of the approaches. Um, I will start with an easy one, which is similar to the first example I showed. It's JXL, uh, it's open source software. Um, if you don't know, JX is an online, online JavaScript spreadsheet editor. It's developed by a single developer in the UK called Bossa Nova and FDL financed the development of a, of a new release of his software, which was published in April of 2020. And for us, it was actually the first project we undertook, a project where we also wanted to check whether the process we had set up uh, was working as we intended it to do. So after we were approached regarding sponsoring the development of the specific feature set in, in JXL, and after we, we went into contact with Bosanova, um, we developed a dossier together and had it validated by our committee and then made a contract for the development of the features. And like I said, once it was published in April, 2020, we paid it was also 10,000 euro, uh, and the project was completed. We look at the second project, which is currently ongoing. Uh, it's in the open hardware area. We call it currently open radio system. <clears throat> um, it's not software development. We are actually with FDL acquiring the technology of an remote radio head, uh, RRH. If you don't know what it is, it's the, of course, it's the box in the picture. Um, it's a, it's a device which you can use to extend the range of telecommunication networks. So imagine you want to have cell phone service in a subway tunnel. The, this is a box you would put there, which doesn't have a lot of range, but it can transmit a signal either 4G, LTE or 5G in, let's say in, in the white corners of your network, which are hard to access. And the objective of acquiring the technology is to afterwards publish the PCB design files and bill of materials under an open source license. Um, so some more info, the whole idea came about when we were approached last year by a small telco provider who was closing down and to ask if we were interested in, in acquiring the technological assets, which included the remote radio head. And since at Next City, we were involved in an, in an R and D project four years ago, which topic was to create an open source uh, telecommunications provider. So trying to research whether it was possible only with open source components to do all, to do everything you need to do to become a telco provider. And that that project we already saw back then that the, the remote radio had not, that they're not being an open source remote radio head was uh, uh, a blocker and we yeah, back then we didn't have any solution. So for us, it was interesting once it was proposed to us to acquire the technological assets to say, hey, we could do this and we could publish it. The PCB design and BOM uh, bill of materials under open source license. So 
everyone who is in the field of software defined radio signal processing, open source radio would have one missing component to building a complete solution. So long story short, we started to look for funding to do an acquisition and current status is that we, we finalized uh, an acquisition contract and ha it has been signed and we're in the process of transferring the technological assets and trying to validate whether A, it's complete and B, whether it's, it is sufficient to reproduce the technology and to, for us, and also in the next step for, for any third person who wants to use what we will publish once the project is over. Next project, a complement to the open source and the open hardware projects I talked about just before. Uh, it's open service or the, what we call it currently the hyper open initiative. It's an initiative created by FDL and we already, well, so it's in the cloud area. We already have two cloud providers trying to implement the idea. Um, the whole thing came about from where you all know currently interoperability in the cloud is is a topic much discussed about with initiatives such as Gaia X and also reversibility um, is just as important. And we thought that imagine you're using open source software, you're using open hardware, but if a service is not open, you can never completely reproduce a cloud solution or a cloud service. So our idea was to, to create an initiative and to, to try and establish open service as an as a equal part next to open source software and open hardware and to apply the four freedoms of free software to, to the service industry. So it means open service means that a service has to be usable. You have to be able to study how it's made. You have to be able to modify it and you have to be able to become your own provider of that service. So in the cloud for us, this means uh, there must be transparency about what suppliers you're using, what components, what procedures. And uh, yes, basically to formalize this into something which cloud providers interested in could cooperate with us, we said, let's create an initiative, which we call the hyper open initiative and the current status, as I said earlier, is we already have two cloud providers who are interested in implementing it. And for us, this means there are two, <clears throat> two, two companies, which with whom we are working together to to, to look how this can actually be done, what needs to be documented to make a service reproducible. And yeah, we are working on documentation quite a lot. And also in parallel, we are trying to create the underlying association and structure <clears throat> for, for this initiative. Next project, we're going into open data. It's also, it's, it was the second project we were working on at FDL. Uh, it's called AFS.1, awesome free software. It's a directory of European open source software publishers and with the, or the selling purpose, with the, the unique point that it's uh, focusing on success cases uh, for us. It's, it's a question we often run into if we are in sales trying to sell free software. There, we seldomly get asked how many stars does the software have on GitHub, but we get asked, okay, which large industrial is using this? Can you show me an example? Or where is this used in a public administration where we can actually see what it's doing? So based on getting this question a lot of times, we thought, why don't we do uh, like a yellow pages of European open source software publishers, but based, not based, but using, uh, showing, showing the use cases and to make the whole thing in an open and contributable format. So the links are up there for everyone to check out if you're interested. So we have all the data in JSON format on a Git repository. You can contribute to it. And the idea is to have that data exportable and integratable in third party applications. Yes, just to be able to, if you have a catalog of 
famous proprietary software one and a catalog of famous proprietary software two that you also have the possibility to create a catalog of uh, free and open source software publishers and their solutions, including their success cases. And in the first step, or this was our first, so we used the first donations we had in this project to to create the first the website, which at that time had about 150 publishers and their solutions and success cases. <clears throat> it's currently still at that level since we didn't have the budget to continue all the time to continue working on it. Uh, it was in 2019 where we also mentioned it during the European Commission's workshop on the future of open source software and hardware. And we were, no, we, we, we did a follow up pitch project for a bigger initiative on, on European level, but nothing came out of it to this point, unfortunately, but it was still interesting to discuss and work on it. The current status is that we have a backlog of about 150 publishers we would like to add. We also need to update all the, the financial indicators and also improve filtering and export of data so it's easier to use and easier to integrate. So if this is a project you like to contribute to, we're very happy to, to accept donations or also contributions to add more software companies to the directory. The last example I will talk about is from the open policy area. It's about the Health Data Hub. If you're not from France, you probably don't know it. It's a French platform created by the government to collect uh, hospital patient data. And the contract was awarded to Microsoft in what later turned out to be a very questionable process. And FDL um, was involved in financing two lawsuits based, one based on the the tender process or the lack of the tender process and the second one uh, regarding Schrems 2. And the two lawsuits were filed by an association called Santinaton. It's a group of IT companies and non-profit organizations who work in all fields relating data protection in, in the health sector. And the CENIL ruled at the end of the year, the CENIL is the Commission Nationale d'Informatique et Liberté, so I would say the National Commission for Data Privacy. Uh, it ruled that, in fact, the Health Data Hub needed to provide short-term guarantees to, to assure that the data stored on this platform with Microsoft was not accessible by foreign governments. If you probably are all familiar with the Cloud Act and similar, similar legislation, which gives access to data stored on servers of American companies, no matter where they are located. So it was said that this was not okay to use Microsoft for, store, for storing these type of sensitive data. And the second request, aside from providing guarantees, was to also migrate the platform to a French or European provider. So I think this was November, December last year. So it's still a topic which is far from over in, in my opinion. And also if you look at the, the last decree of the outgoing president, one was on requiring US cloud companies to verify the identity of foreign individuals using their services. So I think this will be an, until there's a, a real migration to, to a French or European provider. I remember there was also a the Tribune last week, which talked about this in France, which said this should not take five years or three years. This should be done quicker. So it's a, a topic far from being over. But speaking of being over, that was almost my last slide. Um, coming to the takeaways, um, what you should take out of the last 15 to 20 minutes. First point, software is eating the world, but it's also, it's often found out in, in numerous studies, nobody is really paying for open source software. Um, but provided legal conditions, uh, endowment funds can be a tool to, to facilitate or to incentivize uh, investing in open source software development. Um, maybe this is one of the reasons why the French ecosystem of free software providers is so vibrant and active because it's it's easier to finance, in fact, the development of open source software here in France. And since it's a topic continuously being discussed on European level for 
well, I guess for quite some time now. Um, and since for me, one of the advantages, advantages I see in Europe, I always talk about is that you have 27 different attempts to to solve a certain problem and just by looking abroad at how how other countries are doing and if you're able to pick things which work in in countries that are successful in certain things you you have more yes there's more chances to find the best practice and i don't want to say the french model is the best practice but maybe it's something which which warrants attention which could be replicated elsewhere on national or maybe even on on, on European level. It's also, I remember another tribune from Julia Reda a few months ago, which was asking for just that was the Europe's Open Technology Fund, uh, where she was talking about similar things. And I, I don't know if it's a fund or if it's uh, tax incentives, but if the topic is also like in, in in another initiative, uh, public money, public code. Uh, I think if you take the general interest and if you can argue that open source software is in the general interest and it could be financed as being a general interest item, I think it opens quite a few interesting doors on, on what you could do with open source software and how you could finance it. Voila, and this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'll be available for questions. I think the next 10 minutes and afterwards as well. So let me know if any of the projects interested you, if you have any follow-up questions and thank you for your attention. And I hope you can enjoy FOSTEM in the online version that it is. And I'm looking forward to hopefully next year having a, a real FOSTEM in Brussels again. Thank you very much and bye-bye. So we are live for the Q&A session. Thanks, Frank, for your talk. Uh, that was quite interesting. And um, yeah, I think um, financing a free software project is always an issue. Um, we now have seen how you do this in France. But um, do you think governments have to invest more money in free software projects? And they, do you think they should support it? You also mentioned the EU Tech Fund, for example. So what are your ideas here? And um, also maybe on a national, but also on a European or even global level. Um, do you have uh, any ideas here on that? Mm, well, so let's say, um, Basically, to answer, yes, of course, governments need to finance free software, free and open source software. I think there's already quite a few things which exist from, if I look on European and French level, the, the projects, uh, the funds like Horizon, I think it's 2027 now. Um, it's projects which we are also participating in, and usually they all require the software to be developed to be open source. So I think on this, on the one hand, is is a is a nice direct way to finance free and open source software. The vehicle I described in my talk is an indirect way, uh, which I think also helps because you can, for example, now see it with the Plan de Relance or the recovery plan from COVID, where at least here in France. Um, there's not the administrative infrastructure to handle a lot of small projects. So the recovery funds, usually, I think they start at 50 million or, no, uh, or higher. So all the small and medium enterprises are more or less uh, not able to participate in, in project calls like this because the budgets are much too large. So I think you really have to look at it from two ways. On the one hand, what direct forms of financing can you provide for free and open source software and what indirect uh, tools or, or, or vehicles 
uh, can you set up or support that also allow to finance free and open source software in a much more broader scope? Hmm. I see. And um, what I experience with uh, the administration part of it, uh, normally if you work together with uh, governments or administrations, uh, you are uh, confronted with a lot of paperwork, for example. Um, so what is your experience here? Is there uh, anything which should be or could be improved or is this uh, working quite smoothly for you? So it, it's a lot. Um, I think it's also important to have it because I mean there's also a due diligence on the side of whoever provides the funding who, who decides to give public money to finance a certain project so um, it's, it's necessary to have the, the legal yeah the legal security also on behalf of who is financing to make sure that the money goes into projects which really have the potential to turn out something and it's not wasted so I don't know how to simplify it. It's a lot. <laughs> I'm, handling, <laughs> I'm handling currently four projects and oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it takes time. Let's say it like this, but it's, it's also okay. And I mean, let's say you have economies of scale if you handle more than one project, because you can like from the administrative side, at least from a participant, you can, You can reuse uh, templates for reports. And mm -hmm. so let's say you try to cut corners on the administrative side when you have more than okay. one project. So that, that helps. Yeah. But so once, once you figured out how it works, then it's uh, getting easier by every project you are running, right? Yes. Let's say okay. that it helps, let's say like this. Of course, there's differences on national and European projects, mm -hmm. uh, but still you can like the even for the project applications we always use the same template and you can more or less streamline a lot of things let's say it like this so yeah but it's important so I, I i like that these possibilities exist i wish there would be more um maybe also coming back to your earlier question because i think uh how to say open source has or free software has a is a general interest topic uh, or, or, for a good example um Yes, it's... Yes. I think what we've seen uh, just currently is the Corona tracing app. So this is uh, something <laughs> everybody yeah. or every country uh, needs. And uh, especially in Europe, we speak so many different languages. And uh, But also we are traveling a lot uh, across borders. And therefore, it's a good idea to have uh, interoperable yeah. solutions in place. And, um, yeah, and I also think um, national and European funds would be very helpful to support these kind of projects. And this is, uh, for me, at least a takeaway from this crisis so yeah yes I'm, i was happy to see so many initiatives trying to work on open source software solutions to respond to COVID. what was talked about in the earlier panel and mm -hmm. i think there's how to say a society is the sum of country i always say open source is like yeah, like as a everybody can make a contribution and it's a bit similar to society where everyone can make a contribution so i like the idea of having an open system where where you can contribute to and you will have the potentially the ideas of everyone and the knowledge of everyone rather than something something cooked up by a few people so i'm i'm a defendant of the idea that the more people contribute their ideas and capacities to, to, to something, the better the solution will be in the end. So yes, I yeah. think it's very worth supporting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's definitely true. And uh, I think these are also uh, good uh, <laughs> final words for this uh, yeah. talk. Um, yeah, now we are handing over to the compliance panel, uh, which will happen directly after this talk. Thanks a lot, uh, Sven, for this talk and for being here for the Q&A session. Enjoy the FOSTEM, also the dev room here yeah. uh, on legal and policy staff. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for being here and uh, see you later. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye.